All right, hi everyone. I, uh, I guess it's time to make a start. Um, thank you all for coming. It's nice to see that there's so much interest in Bayesian statistics. Um, so I'm Michael Linden. I'm a PhD student in statistics at Duke University. And this is my first closure conch, so I'm really excited to be here, and I'm really happy to meet you all. Um, I had been feeling quite isolated in, the, in my basement office of the old statistics building uh, at Duke. Uh, I'd been using Clojure for about a year and a half before I actually realized there was a huge meetup in my area in Durham. And it's also uh, the place where the Cognitech offices are located, so I was, I was very happy to see that. Um, I've been using Clojure to doing, for doing statistics for about two years now, and it's been a really pleasant experience so far. I, I wanted to come and share my experiences with you. Uh, this is going to be a brief outline of my talk. The first part is going to be a, a bit of an introduction to Bayesian statistics for those of us who have maybe heard the term but are not quite familiar with what it means. Uh, secondly, how are, we, how are we going to do that in Clojure? What libraries are available? That will lead into a library that I've been working on which started out as a library for random number generation in Clojure but has since then developed into more of a toolkit for doing Bayesian statistics. And then I'm going to show you some examples about how that's actually being used in research. We are working with the neuroscience department at Duke who are trying to um, understand behavior and signals in the brain. And they're actually using closure code to do their analysis, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so the first question I get asked in my statistics community is when I say that I'm using closure, the first question is, what is closure? And the second question is, you know, why are you doing that? And it's a question that I've really asked myself sometimes because there's all of these wonderful libraries and all these other languages. And when I thought about it, it really boiled down to one thing, and this is my perspective on the problem. It seems to me there's a trade-off between the number of libraries that already exist in a language and how easy it is to develop new libraries in that language. So, for example, um, just considering MATLAB and R uh, to begin with, these languages, they're usually, for some students, their first exposure to programming. And they might do that in their, their Stats 101 class or whether they're doing engineering. And as I say, this is their first exposure to programming. And really what they want to do is they want to do the statistics and they want to do the engineering. They don't want the programming really to get in the way because this is only a vehicle to get to their statistical analysis. And you can pretty much um, get up to speed and get started with these languages without knowing much programming. So you can really get started with R if you just know about for loops and arrays and if statements. They try to um, keep the programming to a minimum so that the statistician can then concentrate on doing the statistics or, or, or doing the engineering in MATLAB. Um, Python and Julia are obviously a lot better than this, but they're still very opinionated about the style in which uh, you're meant to program. These, these languages encourage a certain style of programming. Now, it's often been said that if you're doing mathematical work, functional programming is really the style that is optimal for you, because if we have a mathematical description of the problem, this requires some translation uh, to actually implement this on a computer. And if you're coding in a functional style, this translation is minimal, in a sense. So I would argue that if you're doing sort of mathematical or statistical work, functional, a functional style of programming, is great. And in particular, if you're developing new tools, you want a language to be expressive and allow you to implement those tools very quickly. And I find with Clojure, it's, it's not cliche to say that it, it's expressive and the functional style really uh, is suited for this, um, over and above some of these other languages. It's worth noting that before R became the lingua franca of uh, statistical programming, there was actually another competitor, and it was called Lispstat. And it was written in common Lisp. And a lot of professionals actually preferred this. I spoke with professors in our department. And um, one in particular, she actually had a book on her shelf, which was Lispstat. And I asked her what went wrong. And she said, well, for some reason, the community just liked R better. And so eventually, um, statistics departments had to switch from using Lispstat to R, because the community in R was growing so much faster. And I think the reason with that is, you can do your statistical analysis in R very quickly without knowing much programming. If you're to use Lispstat, well, you have to understand Lisp syntax, and you also have to understand functional programming, right? And so a lot of students who um, 
who their first exposure is are, they then stick with that. And you don't really learn some of the uh, more core, um, more sophisticated concepts of programming using R and MATLAB. And a lot of students then find it very hard to switch from that to another language. Because it's easy to use these languages, it doesn't force you to learn some of these more sophisticated concepts. But when you do learn these sophisticated concepts, when you're coding your next algorithm or, or building something new, you see all the time opportunities to use these, and you want to use these. So when you go back to using R, for example, you end up fighting the language because you can't code in the style in which you want to code. The design choices that have gone into developing this language are not in harmony with the way that you want to code. So that is the reason why I use Clojure. Um, let's see if I've got everything in there. I've also, I, I've got written down on my cue cards here that R is a language that can't do anything, but for what it can't do, there's a package. <laughs> and, and I believe that's true because all packages for R these days are actually written in C++, and then they're just called from R for reasons of speed and also um, just the flexibility of how you want to code. So what is Bayesian inference? Well, informally, when we're expressing belief about something, something uncertain, we can usually map that to a probability. And you can argue that probability is related to information. If I gave you some extra information, your belief would change. In Bayes' rule, um, this can be formalized very precisely in a mathematical sense, is it's a rule for updating your belief given information. So in a statistical con uh, context, we want to assume a distribution for our data. And if we uh, restrict our attention to a parametric family, um, we want to find the distribution within that family that uh, best represents our data. So we use th these are parameterized by parameter theta. And we express our prior belief about what that parameter would be by specifying a prior on theta. Once we observe the data, uh, which is denoted y, we can then update our prior to a posterior distribution for that parameter. And this is the Bayesian way of doing inference in statistical models. So let me give a concrete example of this. Um, I actually like to bake, so here's an example. Suppose I run a bakery, and um, for the last 20 days I've been recording how many people come to my bakery. So in that list there, I've got about 20 observations. These are the people, the number of people that came to my bakery. And I assume that the number of people that arrive is a Poisson distribution with some rate. Uh, the rate is denoted as theta. And I want to do inference on that parameter theta so I start with a prior distribution over theta. I know it's non-negative, because I can't have negative people arriving to my bakery. And I also have a pretty good idea, roughly, of how many people aren't, uh, are going to come. It's, it's not hugely popular, so it's not going to be like 100 or something. And via Bayes' rule, I can update my prior distribution to get to a posterior distribution, which, in fact, is another gamma distribution, where the scale and the rate parameter have been updated using the data. So here's an example. My prior distribution is plotted in blue. Uh, weather density, rather. And um, using that data that I've generated there, I update to get my posterior. And the posterior is shown in green. Now, if I, I actually generated this data set um, from a Poisson distribution with a rate parameter 5. And you can see the Bayesian learning that's going on here. Uh, the prior didn't really um, favor anything in particular. But uh, given my data, now the posterior distribution is concentrating around 5. And this expresses my uncertainty about that parameter. So here's an example uh, of a different statistical model using sparse regression. So it's a linear model. Um, my output y depends on uh, these four inputs uh, linearly. And I also have some observation noise sigma squared. I'm going to put a prior distribution on these regression coefficients that's normal. And I'm also going to put a prior on the parameter tau. This prior distribution corresponds to a belief that I believe some of these regression coefficients are zero. This is a prior distribution that encourages sparsity. And I have what's called a Jeffreys prior on the uh, variance parameter there. So now I'd like to get the posterior distribution for the parameters of my statistical model, namely the regression coefficients, the noise, and also this parameter tau. But unlike in the previous example, this is a model where this isn't available in closed form. There's no mathematical expression. Um, you can't write down on paper what this is. So we need to be able to extract information from this posterior distribution. 
Um, and that is when we uh, return to Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms. These are a way of uh, generating random variates from our posterior distribution. Now, this wasn't available in closed form, but actually conditionally, uh, they are available in closed form. So if I take my parameter for sigma squared, I condition on data and all the other parameters, I get this inverse gamma distribution. And similarly for these other guys, uh, the distributions are available in closed form. So let me switch over to some live coding now. So I've generated some data. I've got uh, 300 observations. That's the length of my data set. And I've only got, was that a question? Can you, can you, uh, the yeah. Thank you. So I've generated some data, and the true regression coefficients of my model are 1, 0, 0, and 2. And the true value of the sigma squared parameter, that is equal to 1. So um, this is specifying my distribution. This is specifying I want uh, n many random variates from it. And this is the linear component of the linear regression. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store my parameters in a map that's defined as initial state. And I have these three update functions. What these update functions are going to do is they're going to sample uh, these parameters from their corresponding conditional distributions, the inverse gamma, the normal, and the inverse Gaussian. And they're just going to update the value of that parameter in the map. In the map. So that updates beta, that updates tau, and that updates S2. I now compose all of those updates into a function called transition. So transition is a map that maps maps to maps. Um, and what I do here is I define MCMC. I take this function, this transition function, and I iterate it um, from the initial state. I drop 100 and then I take 2,000. So let me show you what that looks like. If I just plot for you the draws for beta 0 and beta 1, they look like this. Now this is an example where um, it's an iterative procedure, but the point estimates aren't converging to anything. These are generating random draws from my posterior distribution. Um, and that doesn't look like much, but if I show you this, we can use the draws from the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo to extract information about our posterior distribution. This is the posterior for sigma squared. Now, in truth, that was 1, and we can see the Bayesian learning that's going on. The posterior distribution is concentrating around 1. Similarly, the true value of the first regression coefficient was 1, and the posterior distribution is concentrating mass around 1. Similarly for the other regression coefficients, you see these were 1, 0, 0, 2, the final one. The posterior distribution is concentrating mass around 2. So typically that's how we do Bayesian data analysis. We uh, use Markov chain Monte Carlo to extract information from our posterior, and we do this by generating draws um, in an autocorrelated fashion from the posterior distribution. But in order to be able to do this for a uh, wide variety of models, we need a lot of um, distributions at our disposal within Clojure. So I've been working on this. This is a library which again started out as uh, basically a library for interacting with probability distributions within Clojure. Um, it's on my GitHub page, which is Michael Linden slash distributions. And the documentation is found here. So this started out actually just providing idiomatic closure wrappers for the random number generation um, taken from the Apache Commons math library. Uh, and then there are some distributions which they don't provide, so I've added those. And I've also included different ways of interacting with them as and when I've needed them when I've been doing analysis. So um, these are the univariate distributions that I've implemented so far. Um, some of these rely on the Apache Commons math library, some don't. Uh, let me continue. So here's some basic examples. Um, we can create a distribution, say we want a Gaussian or a normal distribution with mean zero and variance one, very simply like this. Distributions are implemented as records. 
and then we have a number of protocols which dispatch on them. If I want to generate random variates from any particular distribution, I just use the sample protocol, dispatch that on my distribution, and if I want to generate three draws from that distribution, just like this. There are other ways I want to interact with these distributions to create these algorithms. I sometimes want to evaluate the probability density function here, or on the log scale, which is good for avoiding overflow and underflow numerically. Um, the cumulative distribution function, and then the inverse of that function. Uh, there's also um, other properties which we want from these distributions, and we can extract them with uh, uh, some other functions that are provided. Um, you can create truncated distributions. So if we believe that something is uh, normally distributed but it's restricted to the interval between one and two, we can very easily create truncated distributions, and then all of the previous functions will work on these. Uh, we can create mixture distributions. So if I believe that a random variable is uh, gamma distributed with probability 0.4, otherwise normally distributed, um, we can create mixture distributions like this. Also for performing marginalization, if I specify a conditional distribution for my data, y given theta, and then a prior on theta, if I want the prior predictive that that uh, creates, um, usually that requires performing this integration. We can do that using this marginal function. Um, if you want to uh, acquire the posterior distribution given some data, so here, this goes back to our previous example. This is a Poisson distribution. I've supplied my data, and the parameter of interest is the rate, and this is the prior I specify, uh, I specify on the rate, and I can easily get the posterior distribution using this. So this is, uh, I think this is another example. Um, I think it's the same one, actually. This is the histogram of my data that I got, the number of arrivals um, to the bakery, for example. The pink was the prior, and I've updated it to get the posterior distribution, which is concentrating on five. Uh, now for the posterior predictive. Um, once you've learned about the parameter of your statistical model, you want to use that to drive business decisions in the future. So now I've learned about the rate, I want to ask the question, what is the probability that five people arrive at the bakery tomorrow? And to do that, you use the posterior predictive distribution. So if all of these distributions, um, you can acquire the posterior predictive using this posterior predictive function. So the probability of getting um, uh, x, where x is the number of people are, that arrive at my bakery tomorrow, that follows a negative binomial distribution. Um, there are a number of different sampling algorithms used uh, for sampling non-standard densities. So for example, this is what I call a non-standard density. Um, there's accept, reject. You simply um, supply the target density that you would like to sample from, a proposal distribution, a dominating constant, and this returns a lazy list of random variates that are distributed according to a target density. Um, similarly with Metropolis Hastings, um, and I guess we guess get to the interesting stuff, non-parametric regression. So here, for example, instead of assuming a linear model where my output depends on my inputs linearly, now I'm going to assume that there's some arbitrary function. So my output is now some arbitrary function of my inputs, and I'd like to learn that function. So in this case, uh, this could be, say, predicting wind speed, or this could be a stock. That is a function of time, shown in, in, uh, here in pink. And then I have some noisy observations of that function at um, some irregularly spaced time intervals, and I want to try and learn that function. So you may be familiar with generating uh, single random variates, or you might be familiar with generating random vectors, but you might not be familiar with generating random functions. So um, I have a function here, random function, and I can generate a random function, and I can evaluate it at different inputs, and I can plot it. Let me show you what it's like when it's plotted. So here I can generate random functions. And this is actually um, remarkably easy in Clojure because the complication in other languages is that functions are, in a sense, infinite dimensional objects. The length of the vector has gone to infinity. 
So for every input here on the real line, the real line, I need to associate um, the value of the function. And in other languages, this is very difficult to do because it's an infinite dimensional object. But we deal with infinite dimensional objects all the time in functional languages. And the way to do that is through lazy evaluation. So these functions are lazily evaluated. Um, the way to do that is through, th these are modeled as Gaussian processes. So this is a stochastic process. And the property of this is that for any finite number of time points, my function f follows a finite dimensional multivariate normal distribution. Um, if we make those assumptions on the function, and then we have noisy observations of that function, what we're interested in is, is the posterior distribution of that function, which we can use for inference and do prediction with. So the way to construct these um, is that they can be constructed sequentially. So if I want to know the value of the function at a new time point, the distribution is characterized uh, only by the value of the function at previous time points that I've observed. So if I know the value of the function at inputs 1 to n, and I want to know it at a new time point, that is simply a normal distribution where the mean and the variance is some function of these guys. Go back here. So if the true function here is shown in pink, and I've observed it at these times in red, I want to generate draws from our posterior distribution. And I've generated three draws here. These are three functions that are drawn from our posterior distribution. And if I generate uh, many more, I can use that information to summarize the properties of this function. So this represents our 95% um, posterior credible intervals for the value of the function. This is typically very hard to do in other languages because you can't really represent these infinite dimensional objects. Let me give an example of um, how this is implemented. So what I do is um, I first create uh, an atomic reference to a sorted map. Essentially, what we're trying to store is inputs and outputs. And inputs are naturally sorted because they're on the real line. Um, and one of the nice things about Clojure is once I decided that was the data structure that I wanted to use, it, it was already there. I didn't have to uh, uh, work too hard to find it. And I'm using a special representation where the value of the function um, only depends on its nearest neighbors. So if I, know the fa if I know the value of the function at 10 and I know the value of the function at 12, if I want to learn the value of the function at 11, it only depends on its nearest neighbors. So what that means is I need to very quickly retrieve the value of the function to the left and the value of the function to the right. Because the inputs are sorted, I can re retrieve that um, in logarithmic complexity. What that does is it first tries to find the largest time before the current input and the smallest time after the current input. And then if it's sandwiched like that, it generates that from the uh, appropriate conditional distribution, which here is a multivariate normal. Otherwise, if it's only to the left, it generates it from um, when it's only conditional left and vice versa here. Otherwise, it generates it from the um, stationary distribution. So this is very useful when modeling arrival times. Say, for example, um, this might be download requests, or you might have clients wanting to use some service of yours at some point. Uh, modeling arrival times is important because it helps you to scale your resources to be able to cope with the demand. Uh, we're going to model this as an inhomogeneous Poisson point process. And the way to generate a realization from that is you first generate a realization from a homogeneous Poisson point process. So here the rate is 100. And to do that, you first generate um, a Poisson random variable with a rate 100. And then you specify, uh, you, you generate 100 uniform variables on this interval. And then you thin them with some probability. And you thin them, um, the acceptance probability is simply the ratio of these two, uh, these two guys. This is the intensity function that I'm trying to sample from. Um, and the intensity function characterizes my Poisson distribution. So given this data, I now want to go back and make inference about the intensity function of the Poisson point process that generated it. So we can do a Gibbs sampler 
again. This is um, for the hyperparameters of the function. And I, I ran this for a thousand iterations. And I've only plotted a few here because I can't plot all a thousand. I think I've plotted about 10 functions from the posterior distribution here. These are shown um, in light blue. Um, and the true, tr the true function is shown in pink. And you can see that the posterior is um, concentrating around the true function. This represents 95% posterior credible intervals for what the function was. And these functions are defined not just on the unit interval, they're defined on all the real line. So you can then use this uh, to extrapolate this function and learn what that function is going to do in the future. You can use this to do prediction. You can um, use this to compute estimates of how many people are going to request that download in the future, and then scale your resources appropriately. Uh, we're using this in neuroscience. So this is the members of the Grow Lab. We have Jennifer Grow and her postdocs and PhD students. And this is my thesis advisor, Suja Tokta. What we do here is they have this experiment where they play a sound to the subject and they record when a neuron fires in the subject's brain. And what they, they, they simply get a set of arrival times and they call this the spike train. And we want to model this as an inhomogeneous Poisson point process. And we make inference about what that intensity function is here shown on the left. And then they're played a sound B, a different sound. Um, we record the spike train, the arrival times of when the neuron fires, and we use that to make inference about the intensity uh, shown here. And then they play two sounds together, and it's poorly understood how the brain responds when it's receiving two simultaneous inputs. And we record the arrival times, and that function is shown here, um, uh, the third one. And they have a number of experimental hypotheses about this, how the brain encodes information from two simultaneous sources. It's parameterized as follows. If this is the intensity function of the dual sound trials, and this is the intensity function of the single sound trials, we believe that it mixes between them using a function alpha. And the target is to learn the function alpha. And once we learn the function alpha, that tells us something about how the brain is encoding this different information. So we want to know if it's time varying or if it's static, if it's firing like A or if it's firing like B, or firing somewhere between A and B. Um, so for example, when we do this, we find that it's firing like A for a little bit, and then it fires like B for a little bit, and then it fires like A for a little bit. So the cell is switching its response between firing like the two different inputs at different times, and this is called multiplexing. And this way of encoding information is also used in telecommunications when you want to send multiple signals down the wire. We're also able to uh, quantify the posterior probability that a child is switching or non-switching. So um, this expresses our posterior belief that it was a switching versus a non-switching trial. Here's another example. Um, when it's listening to A, the intensity function is like this. When it's listening to B, the intensity function is like this. And uh, when it's hearing both sounds, it's like uh, the following on the third here. And then the question is, what does the alpha look like? How is it, um, how is it multiplexing this signal? And um, for some of them, we find that it's static. So the, it's not time varying at all. It's simply firing somewhere between the two cells here. Um, so whilst making this library for distributions, most of this is, is uh, numerical. There's not a lot of symbolic computation going on here. And in order to reach a higher level of abstraction, um, because what people find themselves doing most of the time is deriving these conditional distributions. And these are done by hand. Where is it? These guys, for example. You look at the density of the complete model, and then you condition on one of these parameters, say beta, and you try and work out what the conditional distribution is. Using closure, something that I would like to do is to take more advantage of the symbolic nature. There's, it's not a complete com like uh, computer algebra system yet, however. Uh, we have core logic, and there's a number of interesting work going on in this space. There's Expresso, which is an engine for rewriting expressions. And the reason why I wouldn't do this on a general um, purpose computer algebra system like Mathematica or SymPy is that typically you have a number of different rules to rewrite expressions, and the order in which you apply them um, will d d uh, affect your outcome. And also, um, 
w the order in which you rewrite the expressions uh, will also affect the outcome. It requires some user input in how to derive these expressions. And typically, there are some tricks to deriving these, which are known to statisticians, but it's not automated yet. It's very hard to create an algorithm which is general purpose enough to do inference in any Bayesian model. Uh, there are some people doing that, and that is the field of probabilistic programming. Uh, there is uh, some work in Clojure to implement probabilistic programming. There's Anglican, if, if you're interested in that. Um, but enable to derive these Gibbs sampling steps when you really need symbolic computation. And that is something that I've been working on. Another thing is to be able to implement automatic differentiation. There are Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms which exploit derivative information of your objective. And that would provide a level of abstraction to create a very general purpose Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm for doing an inference. Um, so that was my talk. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm on Twitter. Thank you.